at least there's people. <laughs> oh my gosh, here online, I feel so thankful. I feel so grateful that Hashem created so many forums for all of us to be together. Um, it's just amazing this, this next three weeks actually that we've been involved in and now really nearing the nine days uh, I'm glad I'm here to even give just one message hopefully many messages but uh, you know because previous to uh, the, te the deep teachings of Hasidus and especially the teachings of Lubavitcher Rebbe of these days of Av uh, even during the nine days that were really on the outside doing all the rituals that we need to be doing to show um, you know the yearning and longing for like what's going to be very soon uh, and and not so much like on the inside sad or broken you know there's a teaching that when Av comes in that there's you know we're supposed to decrease in Simcha but the decreased energy actually of this month and especially in the nine days the only way really to to really handle it as it were is to increase in simcha even during Ab uh, in our heart and to really focus on the vision of what will be to focus on what we've been yearning and longing for to focus on you know what um what is about to happen and every day that passes is every day closer to that ultimate redemption, to that ultimate time when the third Beta Mingdash will be up and running, to the time when all of us are going to be together in Yerushalayim and no more Zooms and no more Facebooks and, and, and really be together. Now, we do know that this coming holiday, uh, Tisha B'Av, um, is normally um, a a day we fast and we do all kinds of restricted um, rituals uh, and we're not doing that this Shabbat because the, the ninth of Av ends up being on Shabbos so because that we're pushing it off in essence all the negative energy all the strictness and and ugh, it just we're able to push it off so like so we really now more can focus on the positivity on what's about to unfold we really can push off what we used to really hold tight you know in our uh experiences of of of, of the heartache and the, and, the, and the bitterness of what isn't and we're really today going to focus on um you know studying uh, the artifacts of the veda migdash um, so that we can really get to know what we're going to uh, <laughs> very soon experience in Yerushalayim. But also the Rebbe taught us that each artifact uh, is a manifestation of godly concepts, of almost like a step-by-step -step approach uh, with, uh, to our accessing our best selves, our Holy of Holies, our Neshama. And everything that we that we do uh, in our studying the halachas of building the Beit Hamikdash, which we're going to be studying here together, actually brings about the Beit Hamikdash to its ultimate uh, destination in Yerushalayim, coming from you know the heavens above and down here below. Everything that we study also the Rebbe mentions, the, the metaphysical, the spiritual intent of why these artifacts are where they are, why they are there as lessons for us to achieve our best selves. So, and I uh, can't wait till like we're gonna walk through the, the real deal uh, and the real holy temple, Techa Bumiyad Mamish. So, in uh, reality, the whole day of our life is the whole day in a life of the Beit HaMikdash. And if we can just wake up in the morning, and when we say Modani, realize that the master of the world gave us a key, uh, you know, roadmap to reach this destination of our neshama, that's like, you know, 
the hidden of hiddens. I, I was learning in the book Redemption and Creation, where the Frederick Rebbe actually writes that you know the revelation uh, in the creation of the world is just showing the radiance of Hashem. But we, the people, in the way God created us, we are like revealing godliness in its essence because our soul is God's essence and so our whole journey in life is to get to that point of revelation which that's our inner essence of our heart that has our neshama that's our holy of holies that every day come what may we're doing what it needs to be done to reveal that best side of ourselves so when we wake up in the morning and we're so grateful for another day to get closer and closer, another day, especially these nine days, especially as we're approaching Tisha Abba Ab, to increase in our awareness of the, 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 the roadmap that God gave us. So if you see that moment of waking up as the Rebbe would say, as like a Tchiyas team experience, like as if you're witnessing like a, a, a revival of the dead. You know, imagine waking up like that and just really being so thankful for another chance. And if you see the first service of the, of the, in the Mikdash, as well as you see here in this picture is the, um, the, um, the, 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 it, the copper laver, which was called the kior, and it was made out of copper. Now these beautiful, um, uh, uh, this artifact was huge. Why? Because so many women came, and so many women came with their mirrors. These were the copper mirrors that they used in Mitzrayim, and um, and they were so excited to, to give of what they had. And when Moshe Rabbeinu actually got these mirrors, he was like questioning whether to use this or not, because it seemed to be very connected to vanity. How can something connected to vanity be in the Mikdash? And uh, he had to approach Hashem and ask Hashem, like, I don't know, these mirrors, <laughs> you know? And not only did the response by Hashem was, not accept them they are so precious they're like going to be the most precious and i'll show you even how use all of them and no matter how much mirrors came make it the size of all mirrors from these women which really is a message for us the way the women use these mirrors in a holy way they use it to um, really entice their their spouses to have more babies because pharaoh did not um, allow the boy babies to uh, live and so the men thought like let's not have babies if they're gonna kill him and you know remember Miriam she said no 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 we, that's like worse than Pharaoh's decree because we need the women to be at least surviving no nobody really knew but Midrash actually explains that the babies were fed underwater and they weren't killed and they actually left during Itzias Mitzrayim these miraculous babies that uh, grew up in Hashem's arms, as it were. So Hashem loved these mirrors because they pursued humanity. They pursued bringing more children into the world. They used this, this copper mirrors to bring holiness into the world. And, and it showed their brazenness and their strength. Because Nechoshet actually comes from the word Nachash, which is the, the, the snake. So the symbolism is, is that we're trying to use physicality, l'shem shemaim, for, for, for a holy and purposeful reason, even the mundane aspects of our life in whatever way, and we're going to face the snake. We're going to like not let the reality of the world around us break us. We're going to still be brazen and, 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 and stubborn in a, in a holy way, and elevate even the snake-like things in our life that seems like it's vanities, but we're using it for a good reason, and purify ourselves from the materialism that is not for God's sake. 
And that's why the washing of the hands and the feet, as you see, they did it at the same time, represented this, I'm waking up in the morning and I'm purifying all of my physical being, gonna use whatever I can throughout the day with my physical body in a good and holy way. Now, the reason why it's so important to do this purification that we do every morning when we have a nagel vasar, uh, a ritual of pouring our, on our hands water is that we're, 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 we're aware, since Hashem teaches us, that when our soul left at night and it comes back in the morning, um, there was a process of um, impurities happening. First of all, because when the soul leaves, the body is kind of bereft of parts of its soul, so impurities are more easily able to attach to the body in that state. Um, also, because hands can roam, you know, in different places in our sleep that we have no idea, so we need to purify ourselves from the outside. So the Kohanim did it, we do it. And that's why the first, uh, you know, artifact, if you notice, was the Kior. And this process of purifying oneself before, you know, involving oneself in, in a mitzvah. Many people, um, go once a week to the mikvah before Shabbat to, to really have a full immersion and a full purification. Chabad custom, the men and the boys go every day to the mikvah um, to really prepare themselves for the, for the prayer and the, and the learning you know, ritual of the day. Um, and we know women go you know, once a month, but the but minimally, what we do is every day do the purification um, uh, by rinsing like Kohanim did during the Beit HaMikdash. Um, so if you notice, right after the Kior in the um, place of the, uh, of the um, almost like a, a, again, a symbolism of the next step of what one did was, you would see the um, Mizbeach HaNechoshet. Now the Mizbeach HaNechoshet, again, same material copper, same symbol, symbolism, I'm really now going even a step further to rid myself of the snake-like negative animalistic tendencies, because it's huge, this Mizbeach. Um, like if you look at the picture, it's like the like these little munchies, uh, the little like figures of these men, and it was like almost as big as this hall. Like it was like huge, um, and they had a huge ramp, and every part of the way this mizbeach was made was a clear. Um, instruction for what we do today. Because we know today we don't have the Beit HaMikdash. Today we know the holy service of prayer replaces the Beit HaMikdash. We know when we look in our Siddur, there are sections of Korbanot that we say every day. And just like the Kohanim would bring animals to the table of the, the, the altar, um, we too every day bring our animalistic tendencies on the altar of our, you know, uh, miniature experience of being in the Beit HaMikdash as we open the Siddur. So um, in Lukate Torah, Parsha's uh, Truma, where the altar actually talks about the fact that the animals that they brought represented their animalistic personality. So someone who had a goring, angry, anxious personality would bring an ox. Someone who had a lustful personality would bring a sheep. Someone who had lustful, addictive, you know, they love, love, you know, too much to their detriment. Um, then, um, than someone who had a goat-like, stubborn, um, depressed personality would bring a goat, and someone who had a very destructive, talkative personality would bring a bird. And each one was a representation 
um, actually there are four elements. If someone was a fiery personality, we had that in many other classes, they would bring the ox and if they had the water element of lusting, they would bring, you know, again, the sheep and the talkative air element personality would bring the bird and the earthy, depressed, lazy, you know, type of personality, stubborn personality would bring the goat. So every day we wake up in the morning uh, after doing Negevast and we approach Hashem as if we're approaching Hashem as a Kohen in our own Siddur. We're cognizant that we're bringing up our animal and realizing that we can't do it ourselves. We need Hashem to get rid of our animal. That's the only way. That's why people are going to so many zillions of different places to get different kind of help to fix themselves and really the first ingredient is turning to Hashem and realizing you have your own Beit HaMikdash to get rid of your animal. And yes, you have to do it every day anew. So what would happen in the Beit HaMikdash? There was a huge fire in the shape of a lion after the process of bringing up this animal would come down and consume the animal. Again, showing us, we just have to show up. We have to bring up the topic to Hashem. I need your help. This anger is out of control. I can't get, you know, on this diet. I, I can't stop talking, distract, whatever it is. I'm so depressed. I need you, Hashem. And only you can help me. And this fire is coming down again. Because everything that happened in the Begad Amikdash is happening today in our Siddur. So, if you notice... The, um, the way it's written, how holy this, this spiritual practice was. In the Chumash, it says, very holy this, temp this Mizbeach HaNechoshet. Now, further along, we're going to see there's another Mizbeach, and it's Mizbeach HaZahav. And further along, you'll see the Mizbeach HaZahav was closest to the Holy of Holies. And it was like only the... Kohen and Hashem, like it was really very secluded, very private compared to the busy, like hustle, bustle, blood, and all, all kinds of, you know, sweet smelling to Hashem, you know, but, you know, it was like, that's very holy, if you, you think, the, the Mizbech HaZahav was like sweet smelling, it was, it was aromas of all kinds of spices, so, the teaching was that the reason this one was considered very holy and the other one was considered holy was because it's so critical on the outside in your life to work on behaviors that could be pushing people away from Judaism, pushing people away from you, pushing people away from wanting to live a more holy life which you should try to more represent, to have that influence on them. You and Hashem in your own private days, in your own private moments, that's great, but like, that's not like the, 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 the essence. The essence and what's so super holy is how you're affecting the outer world. That could bring someone closer to Judaism or not. That could actually repel people. It, it, the thing that you might do can might be the last like you know straw that broke their camel's back as it were to not want to go forward and go and, and, and get closer to Hashem. And so we see the ramp also had a huge message because normally you would think why make such a huge like structure like that when it could have been just stairs. And the teaching is is that the ramp going up to this altar, was symbolizing the baby steps that we need to take and slowly and, and you know, because you, you, you don't make as big as a step when you're going upstairs. And the symbolism when you're on your journeys to get rid of your animal, and really it's a journey, don't be too uh, rushed don't be too pulled toward many Nachash-like, you know, inner uh, thoughts of, you know, of not being able to live in your own skin as is. 
Hashem knows He gave you an animal soul. He knows it's a process. And that's why one of the karbona was korban shleimim. To really remind us that we need to sacrifice perfectionism. Shleimim comes from the word shalem. We are not going to be whole. We're not going to be perfect. So it's a daily process to more and more reveal our inner essence. More and more reveal our neshama. So, you know, sacrifice that. You know, be at peace with the process. Shalom has the word peace. Be at peace that you're not perfect and whole. Be at peace with God's human condition of how it's not so easy to become an angel overnight. And, and that's, you know, the message of, of this slow, methodical, like, you know, process of going up this ramp. Now, interestingly enough, when you learn what happened on these ramps, there, first it was a problem. There was such fervor and such excitement to want to be the first one that people actually, by accident, pushed people off the ledge of this huge structure and caused damage when people fell off. That, um, that another lesson is, is as you're going through your process of zealotness, excitement, wanting to get to that new height, be careful of the people around you. First of all, they might not be ready to go as fast as you. Don't break your relationships because they're slower than you. Don't distance the loved ones of your family or your children especially and your husbands or your wives just because they're not on the same map, uh, uh, road map as you. And at the speed that you can go on this road map compared to where they are. You know, I always say some people are kindergarten and they need time to get to PhD. And some people are high school, so they can get to the PhD that much faster. It depends on the reincarnation. I remember learning in the Rebbe Rashab's Kuntus HaAvoida, I had peace forever from learning this. Oh my gosh, I remember like so frustrated. I'm working on this and it was kind of like, I got over it and I got through it and I, 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 I transformed in kind of a shorter period of time. Like it was like two, three months. I was like blown away how fast. And then I was still working on things that took me two years and I still hadn't like turned the corner, barely. And I'm like, something wrong with me? How come this I was able to fix faster and that I'm not? And so yes, there's sometimes dynamics of past, you know, history with your family members. But here, the Rebbe Rashad clearly stated that depending on the Gilgal of your previous reincarnation, and maybe you did bring to the fire your, your sadness and, and you have a little tikkun in this Gilgal in this generation of your reincarnation. And last generations of your reincarnation, you didn't barely change this other Mida. You didn't change this character trait. So it's gonna take you a little longer this time around. So both can start, you know, at the same point even. But depending on your previous reincarnation and how much you already did will depend how more speedily you can get to that place of that rectification and tikkun amidos compared to let's say someone else that again maybe they never fixed it in their previous reincarnation and it's going to take them a lot slower and even within your own self like it happened to me one was much faster and the other one was a lot slower so we see this experience of this holy sacrifice was the holiest and we all know, sur meira asetov. We first have to burn away the materialism, this animalistic character traits of ours. We have to get rid of these outer layers of our being, one for the purpose, as we said earlier, to really make sure we affect the world in a good way. Between you and God, Adam le Hashem, as they say, you know, it's okay. You know, in your private thing, Hashem wants you to be also good in that way. But like first and foremost, sur me ra, because it has such an effect on other people. And that's why, if you look, Gershon was the first to bring up his artifacts because Gershon comes from the word of legaresh to get rid of. The sur me ra is first, although. 
he wasn't the, the firstborn and and the representative of, of the other uh, other groups that were bringing their their artifacts um, represents even though first and foremost like the Asse Tov is so important like in the scheme of all things but in the step-by-step -step approach the Sorme Ra comes first so that we can Asse Tov so we can get rid of the negative and this is how we do it because there is a negative aspect of the animal souls negative tendencies that we always learn we need to channel it but by approaching Hashem Hashem helps us channel it by getting rid of the negative so that now we can use this animal in a positive holy way this animalistic holy force which we had other classes you know, I'll just quickly say it, fire, anger, anxiety type of people. They're, they're like Yitzhak Avinu. They can really excel in Yirat Hashem and really have Devekus, like of, uh, an, an on wonderment. And they, they can reach such heights of self-discipline. And the water element type of people, they, they're the, like Avram type. They can love Hashem, love Tzedak and Chesed, love people. And the talkative people are... <laughs> The people who you know give classes, or they're counselors, or they're singers, or orators, and there's the earthy element that uses their animalistic tendency for a positive way by contemplation, a slowness, methodical thinking, deep meditation, creativity. You know, the list goes on. So, what we're trying to do is realize that although intellect can be perceived by our mind the ultimate goal is for divinity to be perceived by our heart because that's where our holy of holies is is and by getting rid of the outer layers of our heart it's called uh, the the uh, the brit the circumcision of our heart the outer side the outer elements the negative is now burned away, layer by layer, day by day, and then we are free now to go to the next position in the Mishkan. And the next position is the, um, the, um, the Mizbeach HaZahav, as we said. And again, remember, it's not considered as holy because this is a, a more private, um, you know, spiritual, uh, it, it, it's representing the next stage of our davening, which is um, the more uh, spiritually ignited, uh, joyful, loving experience of bonding with Hashem. It's a time of, you know, we realize we just did our work and we're really hopeful that uh, uh, that it, it's going to actually give us um, the results because we're approaching Hashem, our Father, the, of what we want. We're we're in a if we remember when there was a problem during the Korach rebellion, Hashem told Moshe to do the the sacrifice of the mizbeach hazahav and do the katoras and 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 the reason why was because the the effusion of all the aromas of this uh, sacrifice um, really represents all um, all of the ways by which we access God's protection. Because Moshe was told by Hashem, "Do this, and it will protect the people from this fire and from the whatever." earth was opening up and swallowing everyone and and so this level of tefillah reminds us that our words might be begging Hashem for him to help us but prayer helps the whole world prayer has like the effusion of some smell it's like doesn't stay here it goes everywhere so like you think you're praying for yourself of course that we are always taught pray for someone else first you know and that like speeds up hashem's like open ears to hear your prayers it just like tickles hashem pink that you care for another before yourself please god but um at, you know kind of a key ingredient to speed up the process but 
But even if you're not thinking of someone else, and even if you're not like even paying attention so much to what you're saying about you know building Yerushalayim again and to heal the sick and all that, the effusion of your co-op, of your power, of what you're doing is like going all over the world and really going up to Hashem and changing the gevurot, the, the strict, like, you know, um, you, you know, decrees to, uh, and sweetening them um, to chasadim, to more kindness in the world, to more blessings in the world. So, again, we're, we're uh, when we pray, we think, you know, um, of all these different aspects of the power of prayer, um, when we recall what was done in the Beit HaMikdash. So now once it, you, you've uh, begun to um, do these services, now if you look at the next artifact and where it was placed, it was the, um, the Shulchan. And the Shulchan represented, in the way the miracle that happened, that just a little of the portion of the bread that lasted a whole week fresh as it became freshly baked out of the oven, miracles of miracles, and that little piece was satisfying and sustained the Kohan. I remember just recently reading in one of the Hayom Yoms of the daily teachings of the Rebbe, one of the stories was that some Chassid said that you know, since learning and praying and really engaging in spiritual practices, he realizes that he, he needs to eat half the amount of food because the physical uh, sustenance that comes from spiritual practices cannot be overstated. That it really sustains our physical body, it brings healing and nourishment, um, and so that we can live a life of, of you know, uh, pursuing more of Kedusha and not like, you know, spending so many zillions of hours in the kitchen and zillions of hours of eating and eating and eating. That we can really, as science does show, under eat. And there's actually, now that the fast is almost happening, a chemical, NRF2, scientists has shown. When you fast or when you under eat, this chemical is produced, which is as powerful as antioxidants, anti-inflammation, and all the very expensive strawberries and blueberries, you know, in the world to, uh, you know. So we see that um, the Kedusha does help us be able to um, be satisfied with less. And the way the structure of the Shulchan was, was upward. And normally, you know, when you have like a full table, it's like long and you can see everything. So the hiddenness of the structure of this, um, of this table represented modesty in, in what you have. A little modesty goes a long way, not to like, you know, to show it off. And one of the teachings, and I remember learning as it's connected to this table, the Shulchan, um, when Hashem was taking the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim, um, it says, I, and not a malach, I, I, it says, I, Hashem, with my own hand, took the Jewish people out. And it could have said, I, and my thousands and endless infinite legions came with me. Hashem was showing how not to show off. Yes, Hashem is powerful. Yes, Hashem, legions and legions of army-like, you know, uh, soldiers that he has in his Tzviyos Hashem, you know, army. But he didn't. He came modestly, by himself, without all the fanfare and all the, you know, exaggerated, you know, imagery of, of this, this coming with it all. And so the table showed that. And it also showed it in the Midbar, when people were getting the man from Shemayim. Many people think the man was given differently to different categories of people. Oh, if you're a tzaddik, it came to your door. And if you were a middleman, it came in the middle of the, the road or in the middle of the city. And if, it, and if you were like the least of the holiest, then you would, it would be found in the farthest ends of the city. That wasn't true. 
everyone got it at their doorsteps. The tzaddik said, ah, this is enough. Thank you, Hashem. This is my portion. The one that wasn't so holy, well, maybe there's a better piece, a bigger piece, a better steak. And the other one will go turning every corner and every stone to find the best meat on the market, you know, and not be satisfied, you know, with, you know, with what's nearby and, and what's easiest and what's, you know, simple life of, you know. Um, and of course, like, we always love to, to, to celebrate. We always love to give Shefa. We always love, you know, to do our best to be the most giving. But in your own home, in your own daily experiencing of feeding yourself, try to learn from the Shulchan. Try to learn, you know, not to like go running around, you know, getting the best of the best of the best, even when you do have certain, you know, simchas. Like, how much more time could have spent with the children to prepare for the holy bar mitzvah or the holy bas mitzvah? Or how much more could have been prepared, you know, to be with your family and teach them like the holidays coming up instead of like, you know, constantly leaving them, constantly shopping for the best, the best, the best. And then what do you have? You're exhausted. You didn't have any time spiritually to like prepare and or, you know, be with your family in a very toned down, loving, happy energy. There's always room to like really remember the lesson of the Shulchan. So after the Shulchan was the, uh, the uh, and you'll see over here, the menorah. And the menorah actually represented um, learning Torah, wisdom, uh, shining your light of wisdom to the world, and, um, and, and this, this idea of the way the structure of the window was made to be able to be symbolic of the menorah not being um, only for the light inside the house, but the window was created and designed in a concave way. And this concave way was for the purpose of being able to have the light shine outwardly. Because normally the window is made for the light to come in from the sun. But this window was not made for that. It was made for the menorah to shine its light outwardly. And it shined to all parts of the land. And it was a miracle how it's light every which way, in every corner, people could see the light of the menorah. Super miracle. Now, if you look at the way the structure of the menorah was, First of all, when it was first made, Moshe was like besides himself. How am I supposed to make this menorah out of one piece? Hashem said, don't worry, don't worry. Put the gold in, like, don't worry. I'll take care of it, basically. You just do your part. And what happened? He put the ignit of gold and voila. In a miraculous way, this gold went into its design in one piece. Because Hashem said, you have to make it in one piece. Well, the lesson is, don't be so worried about the end result, how it's going to get done. You do your part. Hashem helps. And I cannot tell you, I can spend at least a week, if not more, on telling you miracle stories of projects <laughs> that I've started. I didn't know how I'm going to get the work done. I wasn't know how I'm going to get the money. I didn't know how, how, how. And like... Super Baal Shem Tov type of miracles like that I witnessed with my own eyes when you say you're going to do something for Hashem and you don't know really how at the end it's going to happen. Well, that's one message. Another message is that in the Beit Mikdash there was a law that stated when you light the Mikdash light, two things. One, the light had to come from the outer fire of the outer Mizbeach. Again, symbolizing the only way you can really be a light to others is that you need to be a light for yourself. Meaning, by going outside and influencing other people with the wisdom of the Torah, that's how you'll keep your light. If it's just for you to be a Tommy Chacham, if it's for you to be wise and know and for your own prestige and for your own even spiritual perfect reason of why you want to be a light, it's, it's, it's not sustainable. 
The only way is if you use what you know and give it to others. Maybe that's why you know why I do all this. <laughs> Actually, I recently came up with that. But I remember a story with Rabbi Jacobson, and he said there was a Holocaust survivor who told his story. And again, the same message. Like he was in a in a in a one of those like trucks that didn't have roofs, and and they weren't like like pajamas that were not winter wearable and they were on this long journey in the freezing night and one man kept saying warm me warm me and the other man was like oh my gosh I just want to go to sleep I, I can't I'm freezing I just need I need just some like help here let me sleep and every time he almost fell asleep the other man kept waking him up He was so annoyed, but he felt so bad, and he kept warming this guy up. Daybreak happened. Everyone died, except the one he warmed and himself. So, so many times we feel like, enough already, I can't. How much can I do? I can't survive. It's too much. How much do they, why do they call me again? Why are they bothering me? I, I... If you're helping them, that's how your own light survives. You're sharing your knowledge. It's like giving tzedakah to the poor the, of those who don't know. We all have to do our part. And if you notice, the, the, um, the, the, the second issue of the lighting of the menorah, which is very strange because it says any Kohen, non-Kohen can light up the menorah. Wait a minute, but we know at that section of the Beit HaMikdash, only... Kohanim can be there. So why does it say non-Kohanim? If God forbid a Kohen got sick or something, and or someone from the outside, a lady or someone that's the Israelite, could light the menorah lamp, and then someone else of a Kohen could bring it in, which represents all of us have to light up other people. Because each of the seven menorah branches represent seven different types of Jews of the seven spheres. So it also represents the seven spheres in your own soul. So that's why you're lighting up each one because your job is to not only elevate each sphere, each character trait, chesed, gevur, teferis, netzach, hod, yesod, but you also, as you're lighting up, and, and that's why Aaron could have lit the light of the menorah without those steps. But it's like, by me making an effort to light up others, I get lit up. I get raised up. And you need to work on yourself. You can't just, you know, preach to everyone, you be better, you fix yourself, you're not good enough, you, you, you. You need to elevate yourself, then you can light up others, and that way you end up being raised up higher as well. And that's why if you see the vertical line of motion, of Aaron's hand, because he was raised up by those stairs, and so then he was lighting the menorah kind of in a diagonal, like, uh, like a, almost a vertical, but a diagonal line from above to below, which represents, I'm begging Hashem to draw from above his light, to go through me to light others. Not my arrogance, not my zealotnessness, not my, uh, I don't know, double standardness of pointing everyone else has to be better. I want to be a superconductor. I want to be a channel. I want to be free, like a superconductor that has no impure metals, to be able to flow maximum energy from the beginning energy point to the end point losing no velocity, losing no energy from the experience of being a messenger of Hashem. I beg Hashem, please, I know it's you. Let me be that good example to my family, to my members of my community. I, I know it's from you, Hashem. Let me be that superconductor. And if you noticed, one of the Again, messages is everyone needs to do this. It's not just the rabbis. It's not just the teachers. It's everyone.
everyone in whatever way you can, whether it's one-on-one -on -one with someone, whether it's you know sponsoring classes or organizing classes, whether it's doing the classes, you know, in whatever way we become the menorah. And and interesting that um, we have to be careful not to have this insular righteousness. And we need to move into the world more, um, just like Avraham did. Avraham, his whole life was to do chesed. This is what the Lubavitcher Rebbe teaches us. And not like Rabbi Akiva in the sense of like, he was willing to die because he wanted to show Hashem how much fervor he had for Hashem. I don't care if I die. I, Avraham did want to die. He wanted to continue being that superconductor for the sake of doing the good in the world. So, um, and it says that before Avraham, the world was operating in darkness. He brought the light and continued to bring the light. So that the crookedness and all the things that, that of all the blockages of the world would melt away in the presence of him being a walking Torah, a living example of caring and making a difference and getting out there. So, um, you know, and, and we the women of valor, this is like the epitome, this, this image and metaphor of, 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 of the Aishas Chayel. You know, if you see the Aishas the Chayel, it says, who is this woman of valor? She does not fear the cold, and her house is, is guarded with all the red scarlet like covers. You know, just, they're going to be warm. She did all that she did to make sure her family going to be warm. Well, her chachma, this is talking about, not just her sewing and going to the market and buying all that's needed in the house. Blood represents, from the scarlet, right? Her house is covered with scarlet. Scarlet is, looks like blood. Blood represents the redness and the, and the life force and the vitality of wisdom. And the cold represents cold-heartedness. The cold represents no chachma acting out of no light and just, you know, not caring about how you appear to the outside and not, especially not caring about has to the, to your members of your own household. So, and that's why when the Kohen went into the Holy of Holies, it was a scarlet red to remind us chachma, 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 the light of the menorah continues to shine. You're an example. You do what you can. You sacrifice perfectionism because you're going to have those moments. And there what comes from the word Adam. Adam. The Aleph is Hashem. Dam is blood. The Alufa Shala Oilam gave us the power of his wisdom and his Torah. Again. The importance of learning Torah after davening gives us this complete the, the 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 process of redeeming our heart. You remember a long time ago, maybe a couple months ago, we were here. We we're talking about prayer is an open heart surgery. It's getting rid of the layers. It's getting the heart ready. It's it's getting the gook out of our heart. But. We have to do the surgery, and the surgery is learning Torah after. We need the light of the menorah. We need the light of God's wisdom to pour down into our heart. And that's why the menorah is after. Many people don't doubt it. And they learn and learn and learn. Or they zoom, zoom in class, class, classes. But they didn't prepare their heart for their Torah. So it's kind of like it didn't affect them. It didn't change them. Goes in one ear and one out. Well, in the one ear, the godly soul was inspired, and it's true, and it's eminence. They are really inspired. But then the book is closed. This is from the Rebbe Rishab, Kuntus of Tefillah, and nothing inspired the animal soul to change. Because without the foundation of the first process of our waking up and davening, the Torah doesn't have a clear and pure vessel to contain this light of God's wisdom. Next is the Aaron. We're getting to the gold of golds, the holiest of holies. Again, remember, representing our holy neshama. 
And this holy neshama needs to be redeemed daily. Before we get to the Holy of Holies, I want to give you a, a story about what happened to the curtains because the curtains that were near the Holy of Holies, they covered it. And um, 22 years before the destruction of the temple, there was a prophecy by Isaiah um, that because of this destruction, Shlomo Amela built in the structure of the Beit HaMikdash a hidden passageway to a chamber that Shlomo Melch, 22 years before the destruction, put into this chamber, including the Aaron. And the reason why, because they knew it was going to be destroyed and they didn't want the Goyim to get their hands on it. And when it was underground, on these curtains were angels. The images, and you'll see here, images of angels, which were like a, um, kind of like a video of what was going on underground with these Kruvim on the Aram. The Kruvim were these two angels. And so the image of the Kruvim was on these curtains to show, like it did when it wasn't hidden, what was going on with Hashem in our relationship. When there was an amazing relationship between the Jewish people. They were getting along. They respected one another. The Kruvim would turn to each other. When the Kruvim were not looking at each other, it's when there was disunity. So when the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed and the artifacts were taken out and the public were seeing the curtains, not only were the Kruvim not looking at each other, they were embracing and hugging each other. And one would think, what? Because sinat chitam. Because uh, we weren't getting along. We weren't respecting each other. That's why the Beit HaMikdash got destroyed. So why is it that the Kruvim are hugging each other? So beloved, Hashem wants to make us feel that even as he knows it's the human condition. He knows it was a prophecy that was going to be destroyed. That's why the chamber was made underground. He, it, it was known to him that we're human and it's going to happen. And, he, and you can't destroy something unless a third, newer version would happen. That's a halakha, which is exciting to know. You know, in the prophecy that since the first one came true, then the others are going to come true, that we are going to have the Beit HaMikdash in Yerushalayim, Tefah Miyad Mamish. But Hashem was holding us, hugging us, saying, I know this is hard for you. I know this is not easy for you. And when this happened, when Titus came in and slashed the curtains, there was blood miraculously oozing out of this, of this curtain. The question is asked, how horrific, how devastating, and our blood coming out, how gory. So the teaching was that Hashem was teaching us a lesson. Torah learning is your life force. It's your vitality. It's your simcha. It's your protection. And when you lack the Torah learning, you lack Avish Yisrael that led to disrespect and disunity. And the blood oozing out of the curtains represented you lost your life force. You lost your protection. Had you studied Torah, it would have been a savior. It would have been the protection that you would have needed. That's why when the Lubavitcher Rebbe actually says, what, 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva died because they didn't have Abish Yisrael? No, it wasn't a punishment. Had they had Abish Yisrael, had they learned and, and, and integrated the Torah in their kishke to have Abish Yisrael, that would have protected them from the plague. It's not a punishment. You're losing your protection, the Hashem was saying. That's why it got destroyed. Had you learned Torah. Now, if you look at the design of uh, the Kohen Gadol, who came once a year, you see these, uh, I made some of these artifacts, so we'll go and see here. And I, do, I did and used to do children's programs with the Beit Amidash. 
I actually made out of a cardboard box with pinfoil and ideas for the nine days to do it with your children. But there was different uh, gems on the, uh, I didn't want to forget this, I mean, uh, and, and it goes into the point of each gem had a different um, message. And there was a machlekes, there was an argument, which gem is going to be the final gem uh, on, when the time of Mashiach comes. One said it was uh, the Shoham. Another one said it's the um, Yehashib. I forgot the name, Yehashibet, something like that. And like it was an argument. And some said this, some said that. The Rebbe said it's going to be both. Why? Because it represented the revelation of what's going to happen when the future time of Mashiach comes. One gem has a light of its own. One gem reflects the light of another, of whatever it's hitting against. And this represents the two types of energy, light, healing, revelation that's going to take place. One is because you and your work of this lifetime. And that light is your own light. And it's going to shine. And it's going to come to you. And then there's another light for everyone. They didn't work so hard. It's a godly energy that everyone's going to get. It's going to be the same for everyone. But the other one is depending on how you worked at it. So depending on how we ourselves are like the Kruvim, looking into the, these boxes, the work that we do down here will depend on how great this revelation of this light that will take place when Mashiach comes. And in the uh, imagery of the Kruvim that were on top, some say it was like a husband and wife image representing Hashem and the Jewish people. Some say it was the image of two children showing us that we should have achtus and we're all the same, we're all God's children. And the angels would look down, representing the only way to attain such unity between Hashem and our people or other people between one and the other is constantly looking down at the Torah guideposts, uh, you know. And inside, actually, the Kruvim uh, uh, and, the, and the three boxes were like, you know, one in gold, one in wood, and another one in gold. And inside, believe it or not, was the Ten Commandments that Moshe got at Har Sinai, but it also included the Ten Commandments that were shattered, the first one. And these shattered pieces were journeying along during the time of the desert, the Mishkan, all the way to the Beit HaMikdash, representing our broken pieces of our lives our failures, our falls, our imperfections, they're all counted as the journeys. As this last week's Parsha, Masai said like a Hashem, like a king took uh, and said, here, you know, this is where you had a headache and here is where you, had a, you were cold and here is where you were sleeping. Uh, and the king is like on his way back, having had gone all around the world to heal his child, telling him that all these journeys were part of the healing journey. And the, and the head, when you had a headache, it's really when your head got in the way. And the coldness is when you had cold heartedness, and you were not so passionate about our relationship. And the sleeping, you were a bit lazy, lethargic, slow. You weren't like getting up like a you know, like a, like a deer and, and, and like a lion and like an eagle and all these things. You're just like, but Hashem says, all oh, this is part of the journey. And it's dear and precious to me that I want it in the Holy of Holies with the whole Ten Commandments. And the three boxes actually represented the three different aspects of our lives. The gold on the outside represents our gold behavior. Remember, that's why it's the bigger one. The bigger one is gold because we need to be working on our outer behaviors. We have to be more careful about being golden. You know, they say, if you see someone without a smile, give them yours. Shine your light. 
Even you feel like they don't deserve it. Even though they treated you disrespectfully in front of the other family members. You be the example. You be the light outside, which does affect everyone. And affects the person also eventually to become more like you, gold. The wooden piece of the box, the inner box, represent, you know, things that are like the mundane. The word shitim, the word for the wood that was used, come from the word shitim, which is the word shtus, which is folly. Meaning the mundane, the things that like, you know, sometimes you're silly and you're dancing at a wedding and you see all these rabbis dancing silly. No, it's not silly. Actually, if you know the deeper meaning, when they were dancing, they were drawing down the wisdom of Hashem through their dancing to empower this couple to have more happiness and more wisdom in their marriage. You're just playing Play-Doh on the floor with your grandson. It's so silly looking. You're going gaga goo goo. It's so... It's not. It seems foolish. It seems silly, but it's holy. Bring holiness. See, the mundane of fixing your table, like the... Like, the, like as if you're fixing the ta Shabbos table of the big, the Mingdash table. These are holy, the physical things that we do. And the inner goal represents the inner essence of your neshama's main location is in your thoughts. There's thoughts, speech, and action. And the thoughts are closest to your soul. And you think, bravo to you, you handle the situation perfectly. You behave beautifully to your husband, even though he didn't act so nicely to you in front of everyone. Your child, whatever, in public acted a certain way. You're like, bravo, you feel good. You really turned the corner and was able to be gold on the outside. But what's happening on the inside? Are you ruminating? Are you cursing them? Are you bitter? Are you thinking not nice thoughts? Are you, you know? This lesson is you also need to now start working on the inside. Call a kavod, you got the gold on the outside. But you need to start realizing just as important is your thought processes that need to be refined. You know, the Altar of Tanya says, God forbid someone commits a hideous crime, even something like adultery, such a sin. But the impact, the negative impact of thinking of it is worse than even doing it. Imagine how powerful our thoughts are and how important it is to refine our thoughts. Yes, the way we eat refines our thoughts. Rabbi Rashad and Kuntras Avoida says, want to have less alien thoughts? Purify your intention. Eat more refinedly. Not like a grossly and like a glutton. You know, eat L'Shem Shemaim and you will have less extraneous thoughts. Study more Torah. The spice of the Torah can sweeten up your Yetzirah thoughts to more Yetzirah Tov thoughts. All is important. Then you get to the Holy of Holies of your Neshama. Then your gold on the inside. Then your gold on the outside. Then you've every day made your journeys through the Beit HaMikdash and all your spiritual practices that we learned today gives you more and more of that revelation. Remember, you are the essence of Hashem. The creation of the world is just the radiance of Hashem. You circumcising your heart in this step-by-step -step way reveals the God in you. Please, may we ultimately, all of us, by studying this and doing these holy practices daily, get to our inner of holies. And the Rebbe said, by studying the spiritual content, like this helps not only bring the Beit HaMikdash sooner, but in the meantime, bring the holy of holies within us out into the open and into the world. Bless you, my dear Neshamot, that you came here, that you came here on Zoom and Facebook and that we could study this another year. I can't wait. Um, this book, as you see, many years ago, I did these classes, shows all the different artifacts, um, is becoming a book. Please God, very soon, what we study today, it's in the process, I submitted it to the publisher, we're on our last edits, please God, and um, hopefully, 
will hold it together with Mashiach and speedily getting into Yerushalayim, Tefa Bumiyan Mamesh. And I would like to see if there's any questions and um, uh, I hope it's been recording and I hope there's, people are hearing this. I didn't get any complaints, so I, but it's recorded on Facebook just in case. I don't, never know if it's recorded here, but at least uh, it's recorded on Facebook and soon to be another class uploaded on my YouTube. I have a website called yournewheights.com where you can see I have um, five or six adult books. I have 20 or more children's books, both in Spanish, Hebrew and Yiddish, and of course all of them in English. You can see them on my website. Nice to see new people here. Uh, can't wait to, to do more uh, together. Please, God. And if you want the two-page or three-page handout that says most of what, in a very short uh, uh, way, I can text you, email you, WhatsApp you, let me know and I'll send it to you. Um, my email is save. I'm sorry, sane for life at gmail.com. My other one crashed, so I have to think of something quickly. Sane um, for F O R life, L I F E, at gmail.com, or my phone number, you can text me 646 um, All right. Beautiful. Thank you for joining. Would you say your email again, please? Yes, sane for S life. S A N E. Sane for life. Is that your website too.com? And my website is yournewheights.com. Your new heights. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I have an organization called Sane, which is Save in the Shama. And my theme of the work that I do, if you see, is reaching new heights. Yeah, I can, you can take this one actually, and then I'll read print one. But I can send the, I guess you could send the pages. New heights with an S or the heights? Reaching new heights with an S. Thank you. Okay. Would you say for life? Yeah, thank you so much. And write your name, please. Yes. Oh, let's end it. Thank you for joining. I didn't see the uh, messages once again. Um, I always forget after this. If there's any questions or any responses, I like to see. Chat. Okay, one second, then I'll write it down just before it closes. Oh, I don't know. oh there you go. Okay, so how do I end this? Thank you for joining once again. Okay. What is that? This is my last copy, but I used to sell C yeah, CDs. So this is on YouTube and on my website. You can listen to these classes and more, because every year I've been doing it a little more in depth, a little more, you know, in 